The following is a DW Ancient Egypt production. Summer, 342 BC. Pharaoh Nectaneba II stands against a Greek and Persian army on the battlefield of Pelusium. Having rebelled against the Persian king Artaxerxes III, he watches in horror as his large force of nearly 100,000 strong are defeated by a combined army-navy invasion. This last native Egyptian king will flee south to save his own life, but the fate of Egypt will fall to the Persians. Join us as we take you back to where it all began, a story involving 3,000 years, from the dawn of civilization to the end of the native Egyptian empire. Follow the pharaohs, investigate the tombs and temples, and watch as the world of ancient Egypt rises from the sands of time. The topics of this episode include why we study ancient Egypt, how we obtained our knowledge of ancient Egypt, the Egyptian historical timeline, the geography of ancient Egypt, the Egyptian campaign, and the Rosetta Stone. Why we study ancient Egypt. The civilization of ancient Egypt stands as one of the most mysterious in history, marked by its remarkable achievements. Numerous historical milestones originated in Egypt, establishing them as pioneers in various fields. One notable example is religion. It surprises many to discover that Egypt, through an Egyptian pharaoh, introduced the concept of monotheism, the belief in a single god. Additionally, the Egyptians were the first to master the intricate process of mummification. This practice was intertwined with their advanced mythology, surpassing that of any contemporary civilization. In contrast, the Sumerians did not erect the awe-inspiring pyramids of Egypt nor did they construct the magnificent temples that continue to astound us today. Furthermore, their approach to medical science paled in comparison to the achievements of the ancient Egyptians. Throughout their uninterrupted existence spanning 3,000 years, the Egyptians maintained a distinct advantage over their Mesopotamian counterparts in the realms of art, architecture, and science. Even the ancient Greeks held the ancient Egyptians in high regard. Greek historians unanimously acknowledged Egypt as the source of their own civilization. In comparison, the Greeks were relatively recent arrivals on the historical stage, and their epics, the Iliad and Odyssey, were several thousand years after the construction of the pyramids. When asked about the origins of their temple building skills, the ancient Greeks consistently attributed their knowledge to the Egyptians. This can be exemplified by Djoser's step pyramid at Saqqara, where the fluted columns strikingly resemble the Greek Doric column, despite being erected a staggering 2,000 years before the Greeks adopted this architectural feature. The significance of this time span, 2,000 years, is truly remarkable and serves as one of the many reasons for the study of ancient Egypt. Another compelling aspect of ancient Egypt lies in its artistry. Egyptian art ranks among the most exquisite creations of all time. The statues of Khafre, Nefertiti, and Queen T are prime examples, representing masterpieces crafted thousands of years before the renowned Greek sculptures emerged. The astonishing artifacts uncovered in Tutankhamun's tomb also deserve mention, surpassing anything produced at the same time in Mesopotamia. Exploring the civilization of ancient Egypt allows us to delve into the depths of our distant past and discover that these people were not so different than who we are today. How we obtained our knowledge of ancient Egypt. A significant portion of our knowledge about the Egyptians comes from their religious practices. They were known as resurrectionists because they firmly believed in an afterlife. According to their beliefs, their physical bodies would literally rise again in the next life. 
Consequently, they invested considerable time and effort in constructing elaborate tombs and temples, while also burying the deceased with a wide array of items necessary for a comfortable existence in the afterworld. These tombs were built to endure indefinitely using durable stone materials. On the walls of these tombs, the Egyptians depicted scenes from daily life which served as a means to communicate their desires to the gods regarding their treatment in the next world. For instance, if an individual enjoyed activities like hunting and fishing, they would have a scene depicting themselves engaged in those pursuits. These depictions were immensely popular throughout Egypt, resonating with both commoners and pharaohs alike. As an example, Ramesses the Great's wife, Nefertari, had a section of her tomb wall adorned with a painting showing her playing the game of Senate, a popular Egyptian board game resembling chess. These wall paintings in the tombs offer valuable glimpses into the everyday lives of ancient Egyptians. Believing in the concept of taking it with you into the next world, they filled these tombs with a remarkable variety of daily objects. King Tut's tomb is a striking example as it contained over 5,000 items ranging from statues to walking canes and even his chariot. Through these carefully selected items, we can glean extensive insights into the lifestyles of these people. Another valuable source of information is the written material produced by the ancient Egyptians. They developed writing at an early stage and as a result utilized their temple walls as a means of disseminating important knowledge, particularly by the pharaohs. For instance, Pharaoh Tuthmosis III left a detailed account of the historical Battle of Megiddo on the walls of his temple at Karnak, marking the first recorded battle in history. These temple walls effectively served as bulletin boards of the ancient world, offering abundant information about the reigns of numerous kings. Religious texts also provide significant insights into ancient Egyptian culture. These texts, written on papyrus scrolls, unveil the intricate mythology underlying the various spells and incantations employed during the mummification process. Some of these spells were intended to enable the deceased to revive themselves, regain the use of their legs, or even speak. Originally inscribed on tomb walls, these texts were later transferred to the sarcophagus and eventually compiled into the Book of the Dead. Such materials shed light on the Egyptians' perspectives on the afterlife and further enrich our understanding of their religious beliefs. The Greek historian Herodotus is another valuable source for Egyptian historical information. During his visit to Egypt around 450 BC, he extensively documented his observations, producing the first known history book on the Egyptians. Although there is an ongoing scholarly debate regarding the reliability of some of his accounts, it is important to note that Herodotus did not possess a command of the ancient Egyptian language and relied on local guides to navigate the country. Consequently, he can be seen more as a tourist than a historian, recording the information presented to him during his time in Egypt. Despite the debates, Herodotus remains a valuable source for various aspects of Egyptian history, and his work continues to be referenced in studies on the subject. The Egyptian Historical Timeline Because Egyptian history lasted so long, Egyptologists divide the historical timeline into nine periods. The pre-dynastic period, from roughly 3100 to 2686 BC. The Old Kingdom, from 2686 to 2181 BC. The First Intermediate Period, from 2181 to 2055 BC. The Middle Kingdom, from 2055 to 1650 BC. The Second Intermediate Period, from 1650 to 1550 BC. The New Kingdom, from 1550 to 1077 BC. The Third Intermediate Period, from 1077 to 712 BC. The Late Period, from 712 to 332 BC. And finally, 
the Hellenistic period, from 332 to 30 BC. The pre-dynastic period, from roughly 3100 to 2686 BC, marks the emergence of unified political entities in Egypt and the development of hieroglyphic writing. The pre-dynastic period of ancient Egypt is crucial for understanding the cultural, social, and technological developments that paved the way for the rise of dynastic Egypt and its eventual flourishing as one of the most remarkable civilizations in history. The Old Kingdom from roughly 2686 to 2181 BC, saw the beginnings of nationhood for Egypt. This period was the rise of the Great Pyramids and established rules for Egyptian art that would last for over 3,000 years. The Old Kingdom is known for reigns of pharaohs like Djoser and Khufu, who was the builder of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The capital was Memphis, and strong central authority was established. The First Intermediate Period, from 2181 to 2055 BC, was characterized by political disunity and regional conflicts that led to a decline in centralized power. Chaos erupted and political rule was fragmented. The Middle Kingdom, from 2055 to 1650 BC, was a period of stabilizing after the Old Kingdom collapsed and saw a nation fighting to regain its greatness. The Middle Kingdom saw a reunification of Egypt under the 11th dynasty. Pharaohs focused on public works, trade, and expanding Egypt's influence in Nubia. Pyramids were built, but not to the same quality as those built during the Old Kingdom. Being built of mud brick instead of stone, they would not last as long. During this time, the power of the priests of Amun began to overshadow the kings and the country was eventually split again. The Second Intermediate Period, from 1650 to 1550 BC, witnessed the invasion and control of Egypt by foreign rulers known as the Hyksos. Through the rise of the New Kingdom, from 1550 to 1077 BC, Egypt developed a golden age of prosperity and expansion. The greatest pharaohs of the country ruled during a time of incredible building projects and beautiful artistic craftsmanship. The pharaohs of the New Kingdom, like Hatshepsut, Tuthmosis III, and Ramses II, ceased building pyramids and focused on tombs in the famous Valley of the Kings. Through the power of their great army, the pharaohs exerted their authority over lands in the Levant and south into Nubia. During the Third Intermediate Period, from 1077 to 712 BC, political instability and decentralized power again fragmented the empire and various dynasties began ruling different regions of Egypt. This weakened the country and set the stage for outside influence. During the late period, from 712 to 332 BC, Egypt faced foreign invasions and dominations by various powers, including the Assyrians. Persians, and Greeks. The final period, before Roman rule, was called the Hellenistic period, from 332 to 30 BC. Egypt fell under the rule of the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty, established by Ptolemy I. The most famous ruler of this period was Cleopatra VII. Scholars acquire the timeline of kings from several lists discovered in tombs and temples that include the Palermo Stone, the South Saqqara Stone, the Royal List of Karnak, Tuthmosis III's Offering Table, the Abydos King List, the Turin King List, the Saqqara King List, the Ramesseum King List, and the Medinet Habu king list. The order of pharaohs are not complete, but are mostly accurate when they are compared together. It is only during the time of the intermediate periods when the list of pharaohs become either unknown or vague. We acquire our basic structure of Egyptian chronology from the Greco-Egyptian priest Manetho, who lived in the 3rd century BC 
during the reign of Ptolemy I. His work was called Egyptian History, or Notes About Egypt, and divided the Egyptian chronology into dynasties. We recognize 30 of them from the unification of Egypt down to the last native Egyptian pharaoh, Nectaneba II, in 342 B.C. Dynasty 31 is the second Persian period, and Dynasty 32 is the Ptolemaic dynasty, which of course ended with the death of Cleopatra VII in 30 B.C. Great reliance is placed on Manetho, but no full text of his work survives. It was so treasured by later writers that they often quoted from him. As a result, we are able to piece together a majority of his work. The Geography of Ancient Egypt With any civilization, we must first begin with an overview of the terrain, as the environment played vital roles in how each culture developed. With the Egyptians, these early people began building small communities along the Nile River, which eventually developed into larger towns over time. Egypt was originally divided into two regions, Upper and Lower Egypt. The Nile River flowed north, which was due to the higher mountains in the south. Just keep in mind that Upper and Lower Egypt was based on the flow of the Nile, so Lower Egypt was the delta region, while Upper Egypt was the mountainous terrain in the south. The Nile River was the lifeblood of ancient Egypt, flowing from south to north for approximately 4,135 miles. It provided water for irrigation, transportation, and supported the fertile floodplain known as the Nile Valley. The river's annual flooding deposited nutrient-rich silt, creating arable land for agriculture. The Greek historian Herodotus called Egypt the gift of the Nile, since the kingdom owed its survival to the annual flooding of the Nile and the resulting depositing of fertile silt. This gave the only source for crop growth to an otherwise inhospitable area. Without the Nile, Egypt would have been nothing but a desert with a few oasis locations. At the northern end of the Nile, the river formed a delta before draining into the Mediterranean Sea. The Nile Delta was a fertile region with a network of distributaries, or branching channels, allowing for the cultivation of crops such as wheat, barley, and flax. The Nile River served as a vital trade route connecting different regions of ancient Egypt. It allowed for the transportation of goods, including agricultural produce, minerals, and luxury items. The Red Sea provided access to trade routes with neighboring regions and facilitated contact with civilizations across the Red Sea and beyond. In the eyes of the ancient Egyptians, Egypt had two lands, the Black Land and the Red Land. The Black Land was known as Kemet and was the fertile lands along the Nile. Think of black as the black soil needed for crop production. The red land was the barren desert that protected Egypt on two sides. Think of red as hot, arid desert. These deserts separated ancient Egypt from neighboring countries and invading armies and was the main cause for allowing their civilization to thrive for nearly 3,000 years. To the west of the Nile, the vast Sahara Desert acted as a natural barrier protecting Egypt from invasions and providing isolation. The Eastern Desert, also known as the Red Sea Hills, bordered the Nile Valley on the east. These desert regions were harsh and arid, sparsely inhabited, and mainly served as natural boundaries. While oases existed in the Western Desert, the Eastern Desert was largely empty of habitation, except around a few mines and quarries. Dry lake beds in the Delta and Lower Egypt provided natron, the salt used to preserve mummified corpses. The desert region northeast of Memphis provided valuable stone, including quartzite for grinding and drilling tools, and limestone for building tombs and temples. Copper came from mines in the Sinai Peninsula and the eastern desert. Then there was gold. It was said by a Hittite ruler that there was as much gold in Egypt as there was sand. This enormous wealth allowed Egypt to produce timber from the Levant and import other goods into the country, including lapis lazuli, silver, ebony, ivory, and olive oil. 
Egypt's southern boundary, at the southern edge of Upper Egypt, was traditionally held to be the first cataract. This was an area of harsh rapids and waterfalls some 600 miles due south of the main exit point of the Nile into the Mediterranean. During the Old Kingdom, this was Egypt's farthest extent. During the Middle and New Kingdom periods, however, Egyptian armies pushed further south, as far as the Sixth Cataract, in an attempt to invade and conquer Nubia. As a side note, these Nubians would eventually take over Egypt, establishing the 25th dynasty in an attempt to challenge the Persian Empire. Ancient Egypt experienced a distinct seasonal pattern due to its proximity to the tropics. The year was divided into three main seasons. The flood season, the planting season, and the harvest season. The Nile's floodwaters brought relief from the arid climate and provided fertile soil for the agricultural productivity. Egypt's geography contributed to its overall arid climate. The region received minimal rainfall, and agriculture relied heavily on irrigation from the Nile. The scarcity of rainfall necessitated careful water management and a focus on sustainable agricultural practices. The geography of ancient Egypt, characterized by the Nile River, fertile floodplains, and surrounding deserts, played a crucial role in shaping the civilization's development. The Nile's annual floods provided sustenance and fertile land allowing for agricultural abundance. The natural resources and trade routes facilitated economic growth and cultural exchange. Understanding the geography of ancient Egypt helps us to appreciate the factors that contributed to the civilization's longevity and remarkable achievements. The Egyptian Campaign with an introduction to ancient Egypt, we must first explore how we regained our knowledge of this time after the collapse of the Roman Empire. This began with Napoleon Bonaparte in his Egyptian campaign of 1798 to 1801. This French expedition to Egypt under his leadership not only had military objectives, but also encompassed an ambitious scientific endeavor. Bonaparte assembled 150 artists and scientists who landed with the army and began what we now call Egyptology, the study of anything and everything Egypt. One of the primary goals of Napoleon's expedition was to gather knowledge about the land of ancient Egypt, its history, culture, and civilization. The French sought to study and document Egyptian monuments, ruins, and artifacts, aiming to unveil the mysteries of this ancient civilization. Napoleon's expedition had a multidisciplinary approach encompassing scholars from various scientific fields, including archaeology, architecture, engineering, botany, zoology, geology, and cartography. The mission aimed to study Egypt's flora, fauna, topography, geology, and other natural phenomena. This scientific approach aimed to enhance the understanding of Egypt's natural history and contribute to broader scientific knowledge. The expedition to Egypt was also driven by political and military motives. By establishing a French presence in Egypt, Napoleon aimed to challenge British influence in the region and control the important trade routes to India. The scientific exploration served as a pretext for the military expedition, allowing Napoleon to secure support from scientists, intellectuals, and the French public. One of the most significant achievements of Napoleon's expedition was the production of the Description de l'Egypte. This ten-volume publication comprised numerous volumes and included detailed surveys, measurements, drawings, and descriptions of ancient Egyptian monuments, temples, and artifacts. It became a seminal resource for Egyptology and had a profound impact on the study of ancient Egyptian history and archaeology. The Rosetta Stone the Rosetta Stone was discovered by a French military expedition in 1799 in the Egyptian town of Rosetta, now known as Rashid, during Napoleon Bonaparte's campaign in Egypt. The stone, measuring about 44 inches in height, 30 inches in width, and 11 inches in thickness, was unearthed during the construction of Fort Julian. 
The Rosetta Stone was the key to deciphering the hieroglyphs. It contained three scripts and two languages, Greek and Egyptian. Thomas Young, an Egyptian physician, correctly concluded that an alphabet, not an ideogram, was at work in the carved images. Jean-Francois Champollion, a French scholar, dedicated himself to unraveling the mystery of hieroglyphs. Using the Rosetta Stone as a starting point, Champollion compared the hieroglyphic and Greek texts, focusing on recurring patterns and shared symbols. Through his meticulous efforts, he successfully deciphered the hieroglyphic script in 1822, thus unlocking a wealth of knowledge about ancient Egypt. The decipherment of hieroglyphs allowed scholars to access a vast amount of information regarding ancient Egyptian religious beliefs, rituals, and mythology. Texts on temple walls, funerary inscriptions, and papyrus documents could finally be read, shedding light on the daily life, governance, and cultural practices of the ancient Egyptians. The Rosetta Stone was originally known as the Decree of Memphis, a decree of Ptolemy V, dated to year 9 of his reign in 196 BC. It offers details about the king's achievements, his relationship with priests, and the cult of the pharaoh. In the next episode, we will begin at the beginning. We will start at prehistory, ancient Egypt before writing. Thank you for joining. The best book for beginners on an introduction to ancient Egypt is Chronicle of the Pharaohs by Peter Clayton. He takes you through each king in detail while focusing on the political and artistic highlights of each reign. Much of this series follows his timeline and is a great resource for anyone studying this civilization for the first time.